Hi, it's uh, I'm Henry Shelford here, Chairperson of Sarcoidosis UK, and absolutely thrilled to um, uh, uh, have uh, Dr. Rabina Coker um, here. Uh, and hello, hello, Rabina. Hello, Henry. How are uh, you? Uh, and uh, um, obviously, thank you very much for giving your time in what is a very cha very challenging time, and obviously when you have very little of it. Um, but I know how much it is appreciated by um, obviously me, but by uh, everyone at Sarcoidosis UK and all the people watching, so thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I, th I think the first question is to ask, how, how's, it, how's it going? Yes, thank you. I think um, in London we seem to have reached the peak uh, and possibly flattened out a little, which has given all of us a little bit of breathing space. Um, we haven't reached capacity, that's because we've increased our capacity hugely and of course because a lot of routine NHS business has been put on hold um, but for that reason we have managed to retain capacity um, and I think that's encouraging um, and everybody has pulled together um, so I think now there is a sense of a little bit of breathing space of course other parts of the country uh, may see uh, their peaks rather later than London um, so I can't speak for other regions. Um, but that's the situation here. And this, and this is just the first, the, the first peak. You know, so I think if we re release what's happening now, we would then have another peak and another peak, and that's what we're trying yes. to avoid, which is why lockdown got got extended. Yes, that's the real concern. Um, nobody has any immunity to this. Uh, there's a very small proportion of people who've had the illness. Um, they should have immunity, but for how long they have immunity is not clear. So if you release the lockdown, then undoubtedly cases are going to rise, and that's the concern that you'll have peak after peak. Is that common? Um, so to, to my layman's knowledge, I thought once you had a disease, you attend, you're immune forever. That's, that's, so that's not the case, or at least for, no, that, for, for that's decades. not the case. So um, we, and we don't know with COVID-19. So for instance, with seasonal flu, you need a vaccination every year. Uh, well, I thought that was because the, the flu itself changed. Is that not, not the case? To some extent, it, it's partly because of mutations, yes. But if you take, for instance, the common cold, um, you don't, once you've had the common cold, you don't get lifelong immunity to the common cold. We wish we did. Um, so that's perhaps a better analogy, but that's, that's one of the, the problems. Okay. So we have no idea how long immunity lasts and there are some reports of people being reinfected but of course that's tricky because at the moment some of the tests are not 100 percent because the tests have been developed very quickly uh, and we're only gradually learning about the efficacy of those tests so yeah. we're still learning a lot about this disease yeah that was I think yeah, and that underlines the the issues that we don't know about the disease and we find it and, and therefore it's hard to make decisions beyond yes. lockdown and play, play it safe, uh, yes. which is the situation we're, we're all in. And then um, yeah. uh, how are people finding it, um, your, how are your colleagues finding it on, on the wards? Well, we've been very fortunate. We've, uh, we've had sufficient PPE. I wouldn't say we've had an abundance of it, but there has been sufficient PPE. Um, I think m many staff have been redeployed to new areas. So they're working in areas where uh, they're not familiar with the routines, but they've been given training and lots of support and people have pulled together. So there's a great sense of teamwork uh, and support. Uh, and as I say, there is some capacity. So we've been very fortunate. Yeah, certainly. I, w when people are, t are talking about, oh, you know, night uh, Nightingale in, um, uh, uh, in, uh, in the Excel Centre, it's had very few people. You know, that's um, a result of the success of the programme. Uh, yes, it is a result of the success of the programme. I think the challenge will be if the NHS decides that it needs to restart uh, elective surgery or other procedures, clinics, um, no. then the capacity that it's freed up won't be there. It will be taken up. And in that case, the Excel hospitals, the Nightingale hospitals could be a lot more in demand. Um, because if once you start doing elective surgery, you need ICU beds potentially for those patients. Um, so you then take away some of that capacity, extra capacity that you've created. Right. 
Um, uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a side note, um, uh, you may be, um, uh, are you perhaps playing with a pen? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apologies. You know okay. what, I, I found that out also. I, um, I discovered my mouse was incredibly clicky. Uh, yes. and, and for some reason, I, I positioned it just by the microphone. So, so in, right. in a previous yeah. video, people have, yes. there'd be a click, and then you'd see the scene change. <laughs> okay. and, uh, right. No, thank you. That's fine. I will. I will stop playing with my pen. No, that's completely. It's completely fine. I just wanted to, wanted to let you know. Um, yeah. Are you? Um, we were talking about uh, the capacity of the NHS and that a lot of things have been um, put to one side. How worried are you about people who should be coming forward? Um, not coming forward. Um, you mean people with sarcoidosis or generally? I think I think gen generally uh, and, and people with sarcoidosis. Yeah well I think it is a concern. I mean I think most hospitals have been very careful to split their A&E and reception areas into um, COVID, suspected COVID and non-COVID and trying to keep those streams separate. I that's, think it's I think very that's important for people to know that that's happening so that because I think a lot yeah. of people are avoiding coming in. Yes. Um, one, yes. one because they're you know, worried about putting extra pressure on the NHS and, and two, they're worried about ca catching COVID. Yes, absolutely. And I understand those concerns. But if you have a life threatening illness or an emergency, you should be consulting the NHS as usual, because yeah. um, what we don't want to see is an excess of deaths and um, illness, not just deaths, but general illness, uh, because people haven't accessed um, health services in the way that they should. Yeah, and it's, that's an yeah. important message, I think, for, it for is, everyone. It is. It um, is, uh, and uh, and important for people with sarcoidosis if they're having yes. if their situation has, has substantially changed that they need to yeah. talk to their consultant, and that might not require a face to face. No, uh, so there's a lot of video no. going on as we are right now. Yes, that's right. No, great. Um, now we've had um, some questions sent in, so I'm going to go into into those. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot, obviously, about shielding because we're kind of in the mm -hmm. thicker shielding now. Uh, yes. I think um, you can't quite call it an initial enthusiasm for it, but this, um, I, I think certainly there's initial energy for it, and now it's I don't, it's feeling like a very long slog, and um, with no no end in sight, I think makes it very difficult, and particularly. Yeah. Uh, so we've had a lot of with lots of people over the last few weeks. Um, uh, saying they've received the shielding letter, uh, but we've also but we've had a minority getting in touch saying they're still waiting. Uh, what's your advice for those who should have had a letter but don't yet have one? Yes, so I think if you think that you're in the shielding category and you haven't had a letter, yeah. then and the Sarkozy, first... to be clear, has been put in the shielding category, so a lot of work's gone on uh, yes. to uh, make sure that uh, it was initially um, uh, not included specifically, mm -hmm. clearly, mm -hmm. uh, and now but it's specifically held out as one of the diseases for which yes. um, you should be shielding. Yes. So if you think that you should be shielding, then I think the first thing to do is to try and contact your uh, specialist or your specialist nurse at the clinic where you're usually seen um, and ask them. Um, it is, I think I alluded to this before, many centres will have hundreds of patients who need shielding letters. Um, mm -hmm. That's quite a logistic challenge. Um, identifying everybody all up front is quite a challenge um, and so there may be people who have slipped through the net who haven't yet been identified people are working very hard to get this right um, but I think if you think that you haven't had one and you should have done contact your specialist team in the first instance contact the helpline yeah yeah uh, and how about and uh, so con contact your, your specialist team and the, and the, the specific helpline that they have uh, yes. And should they contact their GP as well? Um, I think I would wait to see whether you get a response from your specialist uh, within a reasonable time frame. Yeah. Difficult to put a put a limit on that because everybody's very busy. But there should be some. Hopefully, there will be somebody um, looking at calls, logging calls, and looking at emails um, because your specialist has the best information available about your condition and will understand your condition. Um, best. Um, obviously some patients see their general practitioners very frequently so their GPs are very familiar uh, with their condition. In that case it may be totally appropriate um, but I think it's harder for a GP to advise in some cases, yeah. not, not, not yeah. universally. I mean this is, um, a, it's a, uh, yeah and we find that you know sarcoidosis is a rare condition so and uh, as yeah. such 
you know, the, the name general practitioner tells you, I think that it likely it requires a specialist to, to, to provide that. Obviously, they yeah. do have an understanding, or, or in, in, in most cases, understanding of sarcoidosis, but it is it is a, it's a rare disease. They're not likely to see much of it in their practice. That's uh, right. By by definition. Um, yeah. The um, uh, um, the um, uh, so more questions on on shielding. Uh, so um, we're getting um, we're getting lots of questions from people who've been in remission for a number of years, have received a shielding letter, and don't feel they are at risk. Um, what's your advice advice yeah. to them? So I think if you're still under a specialist clinic, then you sh you could ask in the same way. I think it'd be perfectly reasonable to contact somebody and just ask. Um, if you're not under a specialist clinic and you've been discharged, then I would suggest that's probably correct and you don't need to be shielded. Then I would, I would probably ask your GP. Um, but if you really have not been seen or treated for your sarcoid in a specialist clinic for many years and you're very well, um, then I think you have to use your own judgment if you can't get advice yeah. from your former specialist or your GP. Um, this process is meant to be supportive. We have to remember that. It's meant to protect the most vulnerable in our society. And it's meant to enable the most vulnerable who may be living alone without any other resources to get access to the services and the support they need. And it's partly about simple, practical things like groceries, but it's also mm. about how do I keep reasonably fit and how do I exercise at home and how do I keep my mental health together as well? So there's a lot of information in those letters giving resources for people. So the, the overall aim is to be um, supportive not prescriptive. So I think that that just needs to be borne in mind. So if you're really not in the shielding category and you've got a letter, um, in a way that's a, that shows the system is functioning. Somebody has identified you, but it may be that that information is slightly out of date. And if you've got a letter from a general practitioner, remember they may be relying on COVID-19 general advice and may have sent out letters as a broad sweep once sarcoidosis was included without considering the specificity of your condition. So a conversation with them is recommended. Now that seamless transition was brought to you by Facebook Live dropping out. Uh, we only had Rabina for a little time, so we then recorded locally uh, the final questions and answers sent in. It's taken a little time to pull those various strands together. Um, that second section uh, we'll play now. Hi, so it's uh, um, Henry Shelford. Uh, we're back again. Um, our Facebook feed unfortunately dropped. Uh, the perils of uh, uh, doing this from from uh, from home, uh, and uh, uh, so what we're doing now is we uh, are locally recording it. We're going to you'll so you'll see this. Um, it will will not be live, but will be will be posted afterwards. Um, picking up with Rabina, um, we've been talking about um, uh, the uh, the need for shielding, and do we expect it to be extended? Uh, and uh, I think Rabina has very sensibly and understandably said, well, the government doesn't seem clear to know what it wants to do yet. Uh, so um, uh, the, she, she's not in a position to comment. But I think we all think it's very, very likely. And we also all think that it's very likely that the people uh, um, uh, who are in shielding for 12 weeks, that there's a very high chance that's going to get extended, uh, which makes this, this, this lockdown obviously all, all, the more, all the more challenging. Um, we had some questions, Jackie, for, uh, Jackie uh, <laughs> Rabina from Jackie, uh, talking about sarcoidosis and autoimmune disease. Uh, so sarcoidosis is an immune system dysfunction affecting many parts of the body, possibly at the same time. It can be triggered by infection and may cause the same organ damage as COVID-19. Should we not then be concerned that all sarcoid patients would be at extreme high risk of this virus triggering, whether we're in remission or whatever their sarcoid um, manifestations are currently? Uh, and she asked the second question that when assessing patients with sarcoid for extremely high risk, um, how should doctors count each manifestation? Uh, would they consider someone with sarcoidosis in multiple organs at more risk than someone with it only in one organ? Yeah. So um, I think I'd go back to what I said earlier. We don't have specific data for COVID-19, but we do need to remember, firstly, that some patients who go into remission with sarcoidosis stay in remission for the rest of their lives and never have a recurrence. Um, and that's up to a third of people who have an original diagnosis of sarcoid. So being in remission is also um, variable, if you like. 
Uh, and as I said before, we do not so, have... So just to come the, back on that, so about two-thirds you'd expect to see a recurrence of, uh, at some point? Up to two-thirds. Up to two-thirds. Yeah, two -thirds. It's, it's, it sort of varies. It varies a little bit um, between populations, yeah. certainly yeah. around half to two-thirds, I and would those say. Are, and those are the group that, that have come to be treated by a consultant, yes. so yes. not the group yeah. that, that might not have... You know, yes, might have had sarcoidosis for a much shorter time, but so those yes. that yes. come to, come to you. Yes, but we don't have good biomarkers to measure disease activity, and that's that's one of our challenges, and that's not new. Um, and the other question was around assessing um, risk according to the number of organs involved. I think I would say I would have a slightly different approach personally, and I would say that it depends on what those organs are and whether you're needing immunosuppressive treatment, because we always treat people with vital organ involvement. By that, I mean cardiac sarcoidosis or sarcoidosis affecting the brain um, or sarcoidosis, which is affecting breathing and lung function and uh, progressing. So patients who are on treatment for, for multi-organ sarcoidosis are absolutely at high risk because they're immunosuppressed. Yeah. Um, if you have sarcoid in one or more organs, which isn't needing systemic or tablet treatment, um, you will be at lower risk because you're not needing the immunosuppression in the same way. You may have a topical cream or um, you may be managing it in different ways. Um, but I don't think we've got, we haven't got the data with COVID-19 to say that if you've got disease in one organ or two organs or three organs, this increases your risk by X percent because we just yeah. don't have that data. Although I think we we don't yeah because and we don't have really any very very little data on COVID nineteen but we do have some data knowing that um, sarcoidosis is much more dangerous if it's in if it's in more than one organ, um, and uh, and so that I think yes. it definitely does put you in a in terms yeah. of yeah and your treatment uh, will probably reflect that so you're you because you're more likely to be on immunosuppression I suppose that's what I'm really saying yeah no, yeah um, I, um, I know that we're out of time, so thank you very much indeed. For, yeah. and, and I know you've given us extra because we've had some some technical issues. Um, as ever, I, I, like it's hugely valuable. Lots, you know, um, yeah. we we know we get messages into the office. You see the posts on Facebook, uh, and uh, anyone who, who people who are appreciating it know that Rabina does read your comments and, and does really appreciate <laughs> them. So thank you very yes. much. Um, thank you, thank you, everyone for watching. Um, thank you again, Rabina. It's sure. fantastic that you give this time. Uh, it's very, very meaningful. And I know it helps a lot of people. It certainly also helps us in being able to give um, information dir directly from you to, to people so that people have a, have a much clearer understanding. And what is a very difficult time, very difficult to get to any kind of yes. understanding. Yeah. So thank, thank you. You're very welcome and stay safe. Thank you. Yeah, you, you too. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You. Goodbye.